So we're picking up on the lecture from sleep in different animal species to sleep uh, in humans and historical sleep patterns. And I wanted to kind of break this up, one, to give you kind of a break on uh, too long of, of lectures. And also, um, because this is, this is a really interesting concept that is, is actually rather new. Uh, the idea is very old, um, but our knowledge of it is, is actually pretty new. Um, and so uh, just to kind of give you a little bit of a background on this. So Roger Eckert is a historian who uh, became interested in historical sleep patterns after he had gone through many, many uh, historical documents ranging from medical books to Bibles, you know, to writings, to, to all sorts of different um, kinds of, of material and found that people were writing about these and, and using these terms that were very foreign to him and very foreign to kind of how we do things and realized that humans actually slept very differently from how we sleep now. And so when we look at when this occurred, um, we really can see that, that this was in writings um, prior to the 1700s. So what the 1700s, uh, after the 1700s, what that brought us was the Industrial Revolution. And we're gonna talk about that in just a minute, um, just in, in reference to sleep and how that changed uh, our sleep patterns. But before the Industrial Revolution, when we didn't have electricity and we didn't have artificial light, we used sunlight um, to help us navigate the world. And we, since humans didn't have anything other than sunlight, other than uh, candles and, and, and firelight, um, we essentially uh, had to sleep and be awake according to the, the, the Earth's um, sun. And so what was discovered was that humans actually didn't sleep all throughout the night consecutively. So today a lot of people will say, oh, well, you need to sleep eight hours, you know, get your eight hours in or get your, you know, seven to eight hours in all throughout the night. And you're supposed to sleep that whole time throughout the night uninterrupted. And what we've discovered is that humans actually don't sleep like that. Um, and they haven't slept like that for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and so very likely hundreds of thousands of years. Um, in the very least, we know that they haven't been sleeping like that for thousands of years. Um, and so when we look at these writings, what we find is that sleep was actually uh, completed in two separate intervals or segments. So we call this segmented sleep. So when uh, a typical person would fall asleep, it's usually around sundown, the person would start getting ready for bed, um, go to sleep, sleep for about four hours, get up, um, and they might get up for an hour, they may get up for as much as three hours, and then go back to sleep for another four hours, and then they wake up for the day. And so uh, some people referred to that first segment as first sleep or dead sleep. Um, many of them uh, wrote about uh, the second segment, calling it second sleep or morning sleep. And then that period in between where they're awake and up and moving about, they call this watch, watching, or first waking. And so these, these, this was actually how people slept, looking at these different medical books, different, different writings, uh, ranging anywhere between the 15th to 18th century. Now, when we look at uh, this, this is, a, this is one of the book that, that Eckert wrote, uh, At Days Closed, Night and Times Past. This is a very good book, actually. A very, very fun read. If you're into historical accounts, it's, it's, uh, it can be dry at times, but it pulls a lot of different uh, uh, um, pieces out, uh, the writings, and, and, and you can see the, the sections that people actually wrote about this type of book. It's a very interesting work. But the paper that I loaded, Eckrich's paper, um, the, is actually kind of like an, almost like an excerpt pulled from this book. Um, and it is, it is a separate, it's a separate paper uh, that was published, but it is very similar to the, the writings that, that was put in this book. Um, and it's very interesting to see that, uh, some of the things that he wrote about when he studied these different, these different accounts, he found that those that first and second segment tend to be about the same length. Like I said, about four hours or so. 
And people did a lot of different things during this wakeful period. Um, some of it was good, like, you know, relieving your bat bladder, uh, taking medication, you know, reading, meditating, pondering your dreams, things like that. Tending to children, uh, tending to older people, old you know, older people who uh, perhaps needed help going to the bathroom or, or taking care of them. Um, people had sex during this time. Uh, they also engaged in bad things like petty crime, witchcraft, and plot crimes because that was a good time when everyone was was quiet. Now, <clears throat> some interesting things here that we can take from this that we sort of relearn, right? So we we relearn things all the time. Um, things that were known, you know, hundreds of years ago that were common knowledge get lost and then we forget and then we rediscover it. One thing is medication. So now is a very popular thing to do is something called um, chronotherapy, which is essentially getting, taking medication when it's right time of day and right for your body. So for example, if you have cancer, there are some um, uh, uh, doctors who want to make sure that you're getting the most bang for your buck in terms of treatment. So they don't wanna give you a ton of chemo that you're not gonna process. So what they'll do if essentially is give you chemotherapy when it's right for your body. So there are some chrono uh, uh, scientists who are actually, or chronobiologists, who uh, study, for example, uh, they might study um, breast cancer and they go, oh, well, you know, if you get chemo at this point in your menstrual cycle, it, it actually is more effective than if you get chemo uh, at a different point in your cycle. And when we look at the, the way that people used to take medication, we find that some medications actually work better at night um, compared to taking it in the morning, uh, compared to taking it throughout the day. Um, and so this is something, again, that was knowledge that's been lost over hundreds and, and, and thousands of years um, that, we might, that are sort of rediscovering. We also find that uh, there's many that argue that uh, you're actually more fertile in the middle of the night uh, than you are uh, you know, in the evening or throughout the day. Of course, there is definitely some studies that are going on to, to test that. But um, again, that's something that might have been common knowledge hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago that we've lost. But you know, these particular activities <clears throat> were done during the wakeful period because they had that time to, to sit and ponder. And they would do this by firelight, they would do this by candlelight. Um, and you know, it was a very low stimulation of light, so it wouldn't affect uh, how sleepy they were to go back to sleep for that second period. So <clears throat> what's the research that's been done on prehistoric sleep? So we can actually reproduce prehistoric sleep in humans. So uh, Weir did this in uh, a, a very interesting study, and there's there's a few studies that that were loaded on Moodle that look at 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 this. Um, and so what what they essentially did was they tried to recreate this prehistoric sleep in humans, and they found that people actually really liked it. Um, one thing that I want to comment on here that that a lot of people don't realize is that there's an argument uh, that's, that's sort of surfacing now that I that I partake in, of course, and that is uh, a lot of people experience insomnia. In a type of insomnia is when you can't when you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't fall asleep. You can't fall back asleep. So you might wake up in the middle of the night and you really, no matter how hard you try you just, you, you can't go back to sleep. So there's multiple types of insomnia and combinations, and we'll talk about those when we get to sleep disorders. But really, when you look at this, my argument is, which is um, supported by several sleep scientists, is that that type of insomnia is actually not abnormal in any way. That's actually how humans sleep. Um, your particular situation is just, if you have that particular type of insomnia, so that you have not adapted to the current modern way to sleep. And so it takes several generations. Um, and think we've only been doing this, you know, type of sleep from the 17, 1800s, really late 1700s, uh, early 1800s. We've only been doing this sleep for just a little while in the scope of human existence. And so the, the, the main issue here is that people tend to experience high anxiety when they can't go back to sleep. And so when you treat the insomnia like this isn't a 
problem. You don't have a, you don't have an issue. You just need to treat the anxiety part of it. And Weir was able to kind of combat that with this recreation of prehistoric sleep, because what he did was, is he, he was giving them the opportunity to be able to sleep in these segments. And during the wakefulness, they were expected to wake and they were expected to do things. And what people in the study discovered and actually reported was that they felt like very non-anxious. So they, 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 they found this sort of what they refer to as non-anxious wakefulness. It's, it's a, almost like a meditation. They were able to relax. They, they weren't worried about the fact that they had to fall back to sleep because they knew that they should be awake for this period of time. And so my argument is to change the way that we view insomnia in, in these cases, of these particular cases of insomnia, and instead of treating it like a disorder and treating it like a problem, is to change the way that we think about it, change the way that people think who have the condition to think about it, and perhaps that we'll see some really good changes um, I've actually been in the works with uh, some, uh, a particular group in Canada who have um, tried to, to sort of adapt this, this model of um, trying to figure out, well, what does it mean to be anxious and awake in the middle of the night? And so I think by changing the way that we think about this is going to change um, how people uh, react to being awake in the middle of the night. Very, very interesting thing that comes from our knowledge of prehistoric sleep. Now, when we look at uh, societies that, ex that exist today, so, you know, we're trying to recreate it experimentally. When we look at non-Western societies that are, for example, those that are not um, as developed, um, uh, and even some that are developed, we see that segmented sleep is found in those societies. And when we look at pre-industrial people, so uh, those particular societies that are very non, um, very, very not modern, okay? Um, these are very sort of old, old, um, very, very small, you know, groups. We find that segmented sleep is still in, in evident in these pre-industrial people. So very interesting things there. Now, when we look at the history of, um, segmented sleep and how that started to change. Between 1793 and 1830, we referred to this as actually the, the nocturnal revolution because this is when we saw oil lamps, we saw uh, light at night that was artificial. Um, we saw this, this big change really happening in the 18th century. And, and really for a lot of people, for the majority, for the major public, seeing it in you know, mid 18th century, where, where we're starting to see people, you know, really being able to adapt to, or not necessarily adapt, but be able to uh, sleep um, or be awake in, in the night. Um, and that we saw with that, we saw people um, not being able to see at night meant that they weren't scared. And so they were, you know, less, they found it less menacing. So there was less um, ma magical beliefs because they thought, okay, well, this isn't that bad. Um, we see that stores became um, opening, staying open later. Manufacturers, of course, stayed open 24-7, and that's where we started getting shift working. Um, and, and we also saw that uh, nighttime entertainment wasn't limited to just aristocrats. The normal, everyday person could actually go to a show, go to theater at night, and, and you know, they could afford uh, being entertained and, and have that artificial light. Um, we also saw that the police patrolled the streets. Now there's some good and bad with this. Of course, they made them safer, but at the same time, um, uh, we found that that it, it did create some problems. Um, some major hazards of nightlight: um, the first uh, lamps, the the first gas lamps that were uh, constructed, they were uh, you, they used coal gas. Um, they were very they were stinky. Um, there was a lot of pollution that was caused by them, very harmful to the environment. The light was very bright. People weren't used to it. It was very harsh. We also see that, again, like I said, we saw this uh, invention essentially of shift labor in factories, which we, and we'll talk about this uh, later um, in, in circadian rhythms, um, but you know, we find that in the current studies, shift work is actually relatively dangerous to the body. Um, and uh, does re is related to things like increased cancer, 
um, and uh, many diseases that, you know, like, for example, uh, heart disease and stuff like that. So uh, shift labor wasn't necessarily a, a good thing. Um, and people had a really hard time adapting to that. And still today, some people do have a hard time adapting to shift labor. Um, the night became less private, both at home and at work. Um, you know, you have lights on at home. You, people can look into your, to your home. Um, and also we know that light at night does disrupt the circadian rhythm and it makes you not able to feel sleepy because it tricks your brain into thinking that it's daylight. And of course, you know, with more police can be good and bad. Um, and again, there was that sort of, um, it, it made streets safer, but also, uh, you know, the privacy factor was, was of course, um, affected. Um, by about the mid 1800s, that's where we really saw that loss of segmented sleep. That's where really where we can say that people stopped sleeping in that particular pattern and started getting eight hours of consecutive sleep. Um, when we look at you know some of the uh, downsides, we we see that some authors would really uh, say things like, well, you know, modern technology uh, has in, in this sort of style of sleeping of sleeping consecutively means that we've lost that period of wakefulness where we can reflect upon our dreams and reflect upon who we are and reflect upon um, and meditate. Um, and, and, and get close to what was referred to as the human psyche. And so um, many people felt that it was, it was very harmful to humans to lose this period of wakefulness because you don't get time to reflect on yourself and you don't get time to write down your thoughts or even think, think them through. So really, um, you know, looking at this completely, I think what's really important is that a takeaway from the, the, the previous lecture is, uh, so the one about animal species is, you know, should we change our definition of sleep? Um, you know, should we have different types of definitions? Um, do we want all species to meet the same definition of sleep? Um, and also we have to be really cautious in making conclusions. If we only look at one organism or one, one particular species, can we make those, those complete conclusions to say that it does or does not sleep or you know these are the absolute conditions um you know if we don't have an exhaustive study of the same species we really can't conclude a whole lot because we can't just have one or two studies on something we need replication to be able to determine that yes this is the answer and this is what we've found and of course um <clears throat> when we look uh we need different kinds of research um and and much more research just in general on different animals to, to make those kinds of conclusions. Excuse me. And of course, uh, a conclusion that we can make from um, the human uh, prehistoric sleep is uh, really we know that sleep uh, patterns in humans have changed pretty, pretty drastically since the invention and use of artificial light. We're just now starting to see and understand why uh, th 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 this can be bad. Um, so I think an argument can be made for, you know, what should we do about this? What, what do we do about this knowledge that artificial light is, is disrupting our sleep? And when you disrupt sleep, you disrupt your bodily functions and, and you know, you disrupt how you think, you disrupt how you behave, all of these different things. And if you're not getting enough sleep and if you're not getting enough good quality sleep, then that can have detrimental, detrimental effects to your body in your mind. So, I think these are all really interesting conclusions. Um, if you have any questions about human sleep, of course you can um, use the question forum. You'll get extra credit for that, um, or you can email me, uh, but uh, I will address all the questions in the question forum in a separate live lecture. So hopefully you enjoyed this uh, particular lecture and let me know if you have any questions.